John 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Who are the strangers, guys? Who are the strangers? The false teachers, the false prophets. You need to be careful about who you're listening to or you're going to become confused. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Who is he talking about? Talking to, talking about the Gentiles. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Okay, you understand that I've told you before that no one can cheat you. No one can take anything from you. It's God who makes this decision. And it's you who picks it up, picks up the authority that he's given you, the role that he's placed you in. No one took Jesus' life. Remember that when Pilate said to Jesus, I have the power to decide whether you're going to live or die, he tells him, you only have that power because God gave it to you. Jesus isn't freaked out. He knows what he's been set apart to do which is the reason he goes like a lamb to slaughter. He doesn't fight it. He laid it down. And the same thing with his servants, same thing with his witnesses. God has prepared me for what I'm going to do. God has prepared me for what I'm doing on a daily basis, and he has prepared me for what I'm going to do. And he continues to prepare me. I know what I'm going to do. I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. I may not know certain details right now, but I know what's going to happen because God tested me and he prepared me. Just like he did with his apostles. He told them ahead of time, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be killed. And it, the people who are going to do it are those who claim to be doing God a service. I already know what's going to happen to me because I have been prepared and I have made that choice and I have been tested and I have continued to make that choice. You're going to need to do the same thing. I've been telling you that it's also going to happen to you, that every single one of us is going to be martyred for him. You're going to need to pick it up. You need to go and receive that from God. You need to be tested. You need to be built and you need to be prepared. If you're in him, he's not going to just throw you into the fire. It doesn't work that way. Not in my experience and not in the word I'm reading. So again, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he's a demon possessed and he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon, a demon open the eyes of the blind? Then came the festival of dedication. Now we've talked about the festival of dedication. I posted a video not that long ago. The festival of dedication is uh, being celebrated as Hanukkah today. I strongly encourage you not to use that language and not to celebrate as those who celebrate Hanukkah. That is a reformed Judaism practice. In the video that I uploaded on the Festival of Dedication, I read to you directly from the book of the Maccabees. There is no menorah. There is no light. There's no story about light that burned for eight days, oil that was preserved and burned for eight days. That's That wasn't the miracle of the Festival of Dedication. You know what was? dedication, which is the reason it's called the festival of dedication, not the festival of lights. Those false teachings come from rabbinical commentary, just like in counterfeit Christianity, false teachings come from pastoral commentary. Stay true to the word, you guys. 
the book of the Maccabees is not the Bible, but it is a historical account. And so long as it is not being held up over the Bible or equal to the Bible, you can read it as a historical account. And I find it to be very congruent with the Bible, with the history, with the way that it's written. It is congruent. I discern that to be a true account. And since Jesus observed the festival of dedication, I feel comfortable reading the book of the Maccabees because clearly he did as well. I do not, however, feel comfortable listening to rabbinical commentaries or anyone talk to me about Hanukkah or the Festival of Lights. I'll read it myself. Thank you. I was very upset and I'm still upset to learn that because it just is so outrageous to me the the gall that people have to add. I mean, this is their own text. Why would you why would they think that they could add to what their ancestors wrote? It's so angry making and completely outrageous, but it's exactly what's happening in counterfeit Christianity. I feel just as outraged about lies like, you know, pre-tribulation rapture. I feel just as outraged about that, the false covenant, the already saved doctrine. It just, it's unbelievable the gall that people have to do that. So then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. So Jesus is observing this. And I think that's important for us to understand. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus said to them, I've shown you many good works from from the father. For which of these do you want to stone me? We're not trying to stone you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So we, we don't want to stone you for the good things you've done, just for the bad things. Jesus answered them, is, not, is it not written in your law? I have said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one for whom the father set apart as his very own and sent him into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said, I'm God's son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many of the people came to him. They said, though John never performed a a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Well, I'll tell you after reading this chapter, the part that touched me the most was this first paragraph. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. I just think of my precious little dogs who, of course, like they love everyone. They'll just run up to you and um, and they'll bark at you and act like they're going to do something, but they'll run up to you and just, you know, love on you. But I just think of that tenderness between Christ and his sheep, that relationship that he's describing. They know my voice and I know them. And when I go in and I open the gate and I go ahead of them and they follow me, and he's just describing that whole thing. I just think that it's it's so sweet and so precious And also, I think of my own experience of hearing his voice. And, you know, I tell you all the time in these videos about how I would just say over and over, Lord, this is all I've ever wanted. This is all I've ever wanted. Like, where has this been all my life? This is all I've ever wanted. The sheer joy of knowing him, of hearing him, of feeling him, nothing like it. And and the rest is history. I mean, truly, the rest is history. Uh, He's obviously had to build me since he started talking with me, but, but that's it. I mean, like, that's all I needed to feel. I just needed to know what it felt like to have his presence like like that. 
and, and truly feeling his presence like that, it's, it's like when you feel that, you know that there's nothing else you need and you just keep chasing it and chasing it. So I understand exactly what he's saying here with regard to knowing his voice and just following him. The rest is history. There is nothing that is going to take me away from him and there is no stranger's voice that will deceive me. And that's what I try to teach you in Heart Known Series. You got to get into the heart and spirit where you can hear him so that you're not in the flesh. You're not jumping back in and then you're carried away and deceived thinking that you're hearing from him. No, he's only going to speak to you in the heart and spirit. That's why I teach you how to get out of the flesh, why I teach you how to do your own personal accountability work so that you're not all jacked up in the flesh and desperate and going to him in that way, because you will be deceived. You will be deceived by all of the things that you were taught in the world, right? What kind of things have you been taught in the world? How to meditate in your flesh. But when you truly hear him, when you are in the heart and spirit and you get out of that flesh and you're circumcised and disciplined, you are going to hear him. And, and I want that for each and every one of you to have that so strongly that there is nothing that can tear you away from him, that you will bring yourself from that point on into submission and never, ever, ever be separated from him. So to me, that, that illustration and also the next paragraph where he talks about it, it's just very, very tender. And it really reveals the heart of God that he thinks of us as these, as these sheep that he's caring for, that he's leading, that he's instructing and moving. It's beautiful. It's so precious. And think about the beautiful gifts and blessings that we've been able to enjoy here, um, such as having children, right? And how precious and tender and amazing that is. And he even says, if you know how to give good, you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Does not God know how to give good gifts to his children? I think about my little grandbaby that's on the way and how much I love him and I haven't even met him yet and how much my daughter and my son-in-law love him and they haven't even met him yet. We are all so in love with him (laughs) and we don't even know him yet. How much more does God feel that love for us? I mean, if we could feel just a little bit of this and it overwhelms our waking moments, how much does God love us? How much will he do for the children who submit to him, who truly bring themselves as children to him, to be taught, to be led and molded and to do his will. He's so tender with us. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.